uh, in today's lesson of how to prepare for presentations in advance. Uh, um, thank you, thank you very much for the organizer for giving me the opportunity to talk. Thank you for Rami for making the presentation happen. Um, uh, boss. <laughs> Uh, does this work? Okay, no. Uh, I want to talk about uh, some things that I've been uh, working on um, uh, recently. It's work in progress based on my wonderful collaborators, Roberto Emparan from Barcelona and Andrea Puma and Maria Tomasevic from Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. So the idea is something that's related to what Rami was talking about and something that uh, it seems like he's been thinking about as well. So it's this correspondence principle between rotating uh, black uh, objects or rotating black holes and fundamental strains. Just to give you a brief summary of what I'm going to talk about, if you if you zoom out, uh, uh, it's just the correspondence principle gives a way of how to relate black holes and degrees of freedom in black holes to degrees of freedom that you found in strings. You have to do some matching, but the idea is there. And in fact, it should work for a variety of black holes with a variety of charges. But it turns out that angular momentum is slightly more special. What ang angular momentum adds a little bit more complexity to it, to it, especially if you have multiple if, if you're in higher dimensions because in higher dimensions you ha can have multiple um planes of rotation and what we found was that nobody has um actually characterized what different objects and uh, what different ob uh, black holes in higher dimensions what different strings in um, higher dimensions are and what what they should correspond to so this work and this presentation is basically sort of like a survey of all of the all of these uh, um, all of different objects in string theory and black holes and how to connect them based on different approaches that we're trying to find. When is this paper coming up? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the idea that I want to talk about is I'll first give some motivation about black holes in string theory, what we can do, what the what string theory has been good at in describing black holes. Then I want to go into the, uh, the correspondence in particular for black holes or neutral black holes or for Schwarzschild and uh, just fundamental close fundamental strings because those are the simplest objects that you can relate to. And then I'll, I'm going to start talking about what happens when you add rotation. What's the problem when you talk about the correspondence? What are the stringy objects that you can find that have rotation? What are the black holes that you can find with rotations, especially if you go to higher dimensions? And then in the final, uh, final few slides, I'll describe the correspondence, how to map those kind of these two these two pictures together, and then talk about some future directions that you might talk. So whenever I give a talk, my one of my basic um, uh, interests is how to describe uh, the degrees of freedom that are present in a black hole. One of the things that we know is if you look about the entropy of black holes, the entropy of black holes is huge, uh, and that's like I put the H bar in it just because. I like to remind myself that the number of en uh, the, the entropy scale is one over h bar, so the number is huge. It's really, really large, um, which is kind of at odds in, with a lot of the uniqueness theorems that we have. So in, at least in classical physics, you know, you should have just one black hole, you should have no hair, but we have quite a large entropy, right? So, uh, and whenever we have entropy, our, our question is like, can we get this entropy, can we reproduce this entropy by, by some counting argument or by some counting of some degrees of freedom. String theory has been particularly useful for doing so. And I think one of the main, at least in my personal biased opinion, one of the main um, results of string theory was that it was able to somehow reproduce in some, uh, in some corners, the entropy of black holes by counting microscopic degrees of freedom in, um, of, in string theory. And there are two ways that I would particularly like to focus on, and we're going to listen, talk, um, talk about them a lot during this conference. The first one is you can try to explicitly construct microstates of a black hole. So this is, you know, I'm not going to start naming people because I'm definitely going to forget some that are going to talk in this conference. But just the idea is that you might be able, if you take into account all of the possible degrees of freedom that you have available, you might actually construct explicit microstates really in your theory of gravity. The other option is that this is the, the, other, um, uh, the other thing that I'm going to, and the thing that I'm going to be talking about today is that you can reproduce the counting of, uh, you can reproduce the entropy at strong coupling. So basically the Bekenstein Hawking entropy by downing down the gravitational coupling, basically going to the regime where you have no, no gravitational interactions and then you count the degrees of freedom, which are like the free degrees of freedom, where your degrees of freedom in string theory, which are described by some free theory, for example, at, you know, free strings. Um, 
And in particular, let me just focus, uh, let me be a little bit more specific. The string, uh, in string theory, the gravitational coupling is related to the, G, uh, to the string, G string, the um, string coupling, which I'll call G in this, uh, in this case. And the idea is that basically your black hole is valid at the really strong coupling. So you have your black hole, you have the entropy, which is your Bekenstein Hawking entropy. And now, could you find a procedure where you tune down this uh, string coupling in an adiabatic way without losing any of the states, without you know, keeping the entropy fixed, so that you can relate it to some kind of microscopic entropy at the free string side? So if you could do this adiabatically then because of the entropies match, what you would get is that even though you have your black hole on one side, you would have a microscopic description at zero coupling. So at three string theory. Uh, in general, you would think that, okay, this is doomed to fail because if you look at, for example, the um, entropy of a Schwarzschild black hole, it scales this quadratically with mass, whereas strings generally scale linearly with mass. But I guess the, the main, uh, the main one of the main points that I'm going to be talking about in this, uh, in this talk is that units in which you count this mass really matter. Yes, for free string. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I'm always going to be talking about uh, black hole size and always going to be free string. So in this talk, I'm going to mention interactions only on one slide. Everything, okay, perhaps a little bit more, uh, but mostly I'm going to be uh, relating black holes and free strings. So let me focus on one specific example. I'm going to be talking about um, Schwarzschild black holes in D dimensions, so static black holes in arbitrary dimensions, and highly excited fundamental strings in D dimensions. So as we can see, the properties of black holes on one side, you have the entropy, which is a very, which is naturally expressed in Planck units. It has a weird dependence on the dimensions. And we have the Schwarzschild radius, which is also uh, naturally expressed in Planck units. It also has is dependent on the number of dimensions that you work in and the Hawking temperature, which for, uh, for simplicity, I'll scale it with the size of the horizon. So, and the black hole, usually what we think of is, uh, is valid when the horizon size is really large, much larger than the string size. On the other hand, if you have um, highly excited fundamental strings, so uh, if you have you know, a string state which has a lot of excitations, a lot of string excitations, what you can find is that the entropy scales linearly with mass, but this time in string units, or if you like to talk about the total uh, level number of your, of your state, it's basically scaled with square root of n. Uh, and one of the things that also Rami was mentioning, if you look at free strings, the, their size actually behaves as a random walk. So they are not really constrained within the size of, the, of just a string length, but actually they are, uh, they're much, much larger. Because the, what you say is if your M or your N is large, is a large number, then your absolute, uh, then your size will actually be much larger. Yeah. But also th th that will be true also if you suppose the string to be free. I'm always supposing this is free string. Yes, this is free string. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's interacting, it becomes. Yeah. Uh, yes, absolutely. So this is this is just for non-rotating ones. So this is for non-rotating strings. So I. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, sorry, once again. So. <laughs> no, my, my concern was just to, just to, to make the point that, that something should be different if they are interacting or not. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. The size changes. So the, basically, uh, if if you start interaction, right, interaction will start to compress the, the Yeah, but do you want to convince us that the, the number of states are the same? Yes. <laughs> so how do we how do we convince you that? So I'm going to talk about the correspondence. I'm going to say, okay, let's imagine that I keep I will start with my black hole and I will keep the entropy fixed. So I keep the entropy fixed and I want to change the coupling G. So what I want to say is that when do the do these two things change? Uh, I want to claim that the, these two things, so a black hole and a free string, are actually the description of the same objects, this is different values of the coupling G. At strong coupling, I have the black hole, and as I, I, I diabatically change the string coupling, at some point, I will have a mess. So I will have a mess which is somehow you know, in between, between a string and a black hole. And then at really low coupling, when G is equal to zero, I will have a, uh, 
um, I will have just a free string. And when, at which point do we have this kind of like this transition in between that uh, is, was formulated by Horowitz and Polchinski, so this is the correspondence principle. And what they say is that this transition should occur when the horizon, this, um, the scale of the curvature at the horizon is of the string size. So really up to a large amount of point, uh, lar uh, large scale, you will have a black hole. But then when your curvature, be, um, curvature becomes string size at the horizon, this, then you have to include string corrections. And the idea behind this is that basically when you, um, that the curvature gives you kind of like the strength of interactions, uh, sorry, the strength of stringy corrections uh, at, the, at the horizon. So whenever you need to include stringy cor uh, corrections at the horizon, then you should really consider string theory at the, um, uh, already at the horizon scale, which is something that also connects nicely to what Rami was saying before. So, okay, so how do, how do you make this happen in, in sort of like equations? So I say it, that we start with a black hole, we fix the entropy. What this means is that you fix, fix the max in, uh, mass in Planck side, uh, in Planck units. So now if I express this in terms of the string units, you see that if I tune down G, the, the entropy should in principle decrease, but what you have to, uh, have to increase is that the mass should, ha should have to change. So if for, for fundamental strings and black holes, the curvature is just, uh, the curvature is proportional to their Schwarzschild radius. Uh, I think, yeah, so square. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Up, to, up to factors of, up to. Um, what I wanted to say in more precisely is that the horizon, uh, be, uh, the curvature of the horizon becomes of string scale when the horizon is of the string scale. That's the more precise statement. And if you express the horizon size in terms of in terms of string units, you will see that the the time when the horizon becomes of order ls is when this um, this expression in the um, this expression in the in the curly brackets. Oh no, I press something. I don't want to press it again. Um, when the expressions in the curly brackets is equal to one. Oh okay, it's a time. Cool technology <laughs> okay it works it works um so what you can do is like you can yeah at what point does this become one so this gives you an expression where the coupling is one over m in string units so if you start with a really big black hole this coupling is very very small or if you express it with your with your entropy you can massage the expressions a little bit and you see that when the coupling is order of the order one over string scale uh, then uh, the entropy then this you have to change descriptions so everything above, for all the coupling above the, this, uh, this value, you have your black hole description, everything below, you have the string description. And one of the nice consistency conditions that you can see here is that if you start with a really massive black hole with a lot of entropy, then the string coupling is very, very small. So then you really, okay, when the string coupling is very small, so this uh, gives you um, sort of like a um, consistency condition that that you really can use the free string to match onto this uh, black hole regime because your free string should be valid only at a very low string coupling. And the magic that comes here is because if you have your string coupling um, at, this uh, at this small value, if you insert the, this precise value G uh, of the coupling into the expression for the, uh, for the mass of the, for the entropy of the black hole, what you find that it, is that it much simplifies and actually becomes exactly parametrically the same as the entropy of the microstates, uh, uh, entropy of the fundamental strings. Uh, so if you want to think about adiabats, basically, if you think about what this graph shows, it's what happens with the mass as you, as you start with the, with the string coupling. So at the beginning, you have in string units, your mass is small, but then as you tune, uh, as you decrease G, your mass has to increase to keep the black hole entropy large. And at some point when the G string is small, you basically change into the free string regime, which is denoted in this, uh, in this cyan, uh, cyan color. Oops, let's see, oh, it's okay. Okay, so what about the other properties? Does everything else agree? So what is the picture with the temperature? So the temperature will, as the black hole becomes smaller, the temperature will start to increase, increase until at the correspondence point, the temperature just becomes of one over the string scale, which is actually the Hagedon temperature. So the Hagedon temperature is the limiting temperature at which you have your strings is literally the string uh, where the, uh, the temperature at which the strings, strings become very floppy. So that's kind of like a nice interpretation. But as we talked before, sizes don't match. 
uh, and we said because of the random walk behavior of free strings, the free strings will become much larger than actually the black hole. And here is where the self interactions become important. So it turns out that if you include self interactions, the size will shrink. And this is called, you can use the thermal scalar formalism, you can use all, all kinds of effects, but you can use uh, also self interactive polymers to get the same results um, out of it. But the, the main point of it uh, here is that the interaction introduces a sort of like a dimensional dependence in it. But it turns out in four dimensions, at least in four dimensions, the interactions kick in. If you start from the string size, the interactions will kick in at an, er uh, at an earlier stage, basically starting, to, starting the string to making the string shrink. And it turns out it will shrink them exactly to the right size. So when at the correspondence points, they will actually fix and be of the same order as the black hole. So HD of the horizon size. And so the upshot is once you start to inter um, include inter self interactions, your size will interpolate between the size of a free string and the size of a, of a black hole at the correspondence point. And then afterwards, your size will increase uh, just as you know, your black hole will increase. So if you're just a small intermezzo, by the, by the way, when, uh, how, uh, when do I need to finish? Huh? Okay, 25. So, okay, so I have 25 minutes still. Fantastic. Cool. So just an intermezzo, if you're, if you're uncomfortable with the fact that I'm tuning the cutting a little bit and I'm, I'm playing all these games, one of the things that you can think of this is you can think of this as a model for Hawking, uh, Hawking operation. Obviously, for Hawking operation, you wouldn't fix the entropy and dial the coupling, but what you would actually do is you would fix the coupling at a large value and you would let the entropy and the mass decrease. So what would happen here is essentially as your, as your, um, as your mass and your entropy is decreasing because of Hawking operation, at some value, um, essentially the string will become the dominant, the most entrop entropic, um, entropic uh, picture. So it will have more entropy just because it scales as m rather than as m to the sum power, which is greater than one. So what you can think about this is instead of thinking, okay, I'm shrinking g to become to come from black holes to a free string. What you should think of, what you can heuristically think of is you start with the black hole, you let it evaporate. At some point, the black hole will be, become smaller and become a stringy size where you will switch descriptions. So perhaps the endpoint of Hawking evaporation is something like a free string, just as a heuristic picture. But um, this is only now, uh, from now on, I'll only talk about the string coupling and uh, keeping the entropy fixed. So just to summarize, the correspondence principle relating black holes and uh, fundamental strings and more, all, more, uh, more general black holes, in, including Ramon Ramon charges as well, is a proposal how to re uh, relate black holes and uh, stringy objects. And it allows for a parametric match between, um, between, the black hole, uh, between the entropy of black hole and entropy of, uh, of stringy degrees of freedom. So what are the pros, the, uh, the, the pros and the cons? The pros are that it basically works for a variety of charges. It works for Ramon Ramon charges, fundamental strings. Uh, it, in some way, it provides a microscopic picture of uh, black hole degrees of freedom. But, and it can be, as we saw now, it can be seen as a model for endpoint of uh, Hawking evaporation. But one of the main limitations is because we don't know the details of the transition, we are oblivious to any order one factors. So we can just parametrically match anything that's order one, we just neglect it. Um, but these factors can be actually reproduced if you have supersymmetric cases where nothing changes with string coupling. And this was one of the successes of Stromich and Bafa and, and other people where uh, so on and so forth. So this was the background. So what happens now if you add rotation? So in principle, nothing should change, right? So I should still think of this as, you know, I start with the Schwarzschild, I still gently let it rotate. I don't think the string the degrees of freedom should change that much. So what should happen is if you start with, you know, if you have a rotating black hole with just, you know, mass and angular momentum as their conserved charges, what should match is actually just, you know, you should have closed strings which rotate. So this should be, this should be the, um, the, the end point of, uh, so the two things that match. And in principle, one you can see one of the nice con connections that you can think of is that you have the curve bound in four dimensions, which goes at the mass, the angular momentum is limited by how much, how much mass you have. And then the string size, you have the Reggie bound, which is also limiting how much uh, angular momentum you can put in your string depending on your mass. But ultimately, these two things are expressed again in, in different units, right? So the curve mass and Planck units, the string mass, uh, the, the Reggie bound and string units. And in fact, this is where perhaps the relation or the, the nice correspondence ends because they're 
there are many more diffi difficulties. So first of all, at weak coupling, if you, um, if you change the Planck length to, um, to the string length, you can see that at weak coupling, the curve bound is much smaller than the Reggie bound. The curve bound actually goes to, um, would, would be much, much smaller. Um, on the other hand, even in four dimensions, there exist stringy objects like stringy bars and other, other highly spinning objects, which would then violate this, the curve bound. And in uh, completely differently, the cur the, the cur and the Reggie bound are saturated by two completely different objects. So the extremal curve solution has still a large entropy. It's still largely spherical. Whereas on the other side, uh, the Reggie bounds are saturated, uh, the Reggie bound saturated by some rigid rods, some kind of thing, which is highly non-degenerate, but also highly non-spherical. So the two things are in general quite different. Sort of, right? So <laughs> it's not a rod. That's what I. <laughs> so on the other hand, it's also if you increase, if you go to higher dimensions, it becomes even more apparent. So in higher dimensions, first of all, uh, the curve bound is actually replaced by a slightly more softer bound, which is just stability bound. So you cannot have like you can have things which uh, you can have solutions which have a higher angular momentum, but they won't be stable. And also because you have more planes of rotation, you are allowed uh, so it, which you know increase the dimensionality, increase the number of independent planes in which you can rotate, which allows you to have more complicated objects. And especially in for, like in you know, five dimensions or higher, you are allowed for black rings, for example. So then the question is, how many of those objects should you know follow from? How many objects can we track down as we change the string coupling and, and reproduce their entropy? If how many you know if if there exists. Um, and on the string side, the Reggie bound is independent of the number of dimensions, uh, apart from the fact that like, if, you, if you're in higher than four dimensions, again, because you have more uh, planes of rotation, you, you can have uh, circular objects, uh, circular objects where your, your string tension is actually, um, you're uh, stabilized by the angular momentum. So these are called plasmic, and I'm going to talk about them a little bit uh, more later on. So as we talked before, um, so let's start with some survey of string, stringy objects uh, with angular momentum. Um, we talked about before that static strings, which are which don't rotate, behave like random walks, and they're very like what they're spherical, uh, spherical. But um, they're in in principle they're isotropic in all directions, so they're basically string balls. And if you start looking at slowly rotating strings, so where the angular momentum is much it's smaller than the square root of n, not n, so n is the Reggie bound, um, then the corrections are actually very, very suppressed. And it turns out that the sizes and the entropy are, much, are very suppressed at this level. What this means is that slowly rotating strings, so when, especially when j does not scale with any power of n, will essentially be string balls. Yeah. So this comes from if you if you look at the sizes, right? So the size you can calculate the size of a string ball with fixed angular momentum, and then it just falls out in this uh, in this way. So the size um, goes as it changes, right? So if your plus minus come. Uh, yes, essentially you 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 expand in J. And then you get the quadratic uh, connection. This is this works only for small j. Like j must not scale with scale with any power of n, because it is, as soon as you start to scale with uh, some power of n to one half, for example, then basically you uh, this approximation breaks down. Uh, but it's one of the important things that you can have, like literally that your sizes. So plus minus depends on the size of the calculation. So if you have perpendicular size, perpendicular size shrinks, and the uh, the, um, the uh, size in the plane of rotation will slightly elongate. Uh, not directly, not directly. So I think this will, the size will be slightly iffy, right? So the, the size, uh, because this, yeah, because because of self interactions, right? So the size don't even match at leading order. So then it's subleading order. I don't know, but if you treat J as an adiabatic invariant as you fix them down, the fact that it goes as J squared rather than linearly, which is something that you might think is, is important, right? So then the size is this, this, this is something that needs to be dealt more a little bit carefully. Which is uh, the exact definition of rotation? What is J? What are you measuring? Um, no, not, in, not in words, in a, in a formula. 
in a formula, I think uh, you're measuring J as the conserved charge of a, of a, of a world shield, right? Uh, Which conserved charge? Uh, the conserved charge related to, uh, sorry. Instead of the sum over K, of K and K, it's simply sum over M K. You can every oscillator is one to the spin that okay. You can you can it as a k the the same guy, is sorry? Or the same side, okay. So there is no uh the what you are saying at the beginning that yeah, to some extent, yes. Yeah. But I mean uh, for large n uh, this is much uh, the typical value in a distribution is like root of n log of n. Uh, yeah, we can discuss this. Uh, that's what I think they, they consider J. Okay. One more comment for J square equal to n, uh, sorry, for J equal to. Uh, and let me, they, they cancel. I mean, uh, first rigid trajectory states are like point like states in this description, roughly speaking. Oh, uh, it's like a point like object. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Th sorry. Um, okay. So slowly rotating the strings will become like stringy bars so we expect them to you know slowly rotating strings and slowly rotating black holes should correspond re relatively nicely but what happens when i'm increased the rotation so the entropy was worked out by russo and suskind a while ago and what they found is that the entropy actually goes the square root of n minus j so for highly like if j is uh, scaled with some power of n basically you see that the entropy starts to decrease much uh, to much uh, uh, to much greater extent than before and what you find is that this would also mean that you know black, uh, rods which have which saturate the Reggie bound would have no degeneracy at all. And what you can find is that this this effect, this highly uh, highly um, high rotation, basically pancakes the string, right? So it decreases uh, decreases the perpendicular directions on basically onto the plane of rotation. So the perpendicular size sizes now still behave like a random walk. But they actually became like more of a suppressed random walk. So the size is actually not just proportional to n, but proportional to square root of n minus j. Whereas the perpendicular size will then, because j scales with n, basically the perpendicular size will still scale as n. So you will have suppression, you will have a slightly more suppression uh, in the planes perpendicular to the, um, to the rotation. But also you can find some, uh, some uh, different, uh, besides just pancakes, which I would think of like something which is full on the inside. You can also have something which is a plasmid, which is just a which is just a coil of strings looping around on each other, and there you have some uh, some or some bars, and you can think of where does the angular momentum come from? This, uh, sorry, where does the entropy come from? Is it comes from random? It comes from random walks just around this kind of configuration. So you have some entropy left with the wiggles approximating uh, around these configurations, but the average configuration should look like you know a bar or a plasmid. Okay, what about black holes? In four dimensions, we will consider only Kerr. Um, and what you can see is that basically all the properties come from, are very similar to just the Schwarzschild in four directions, apart from the fact that you will see these uh, yellow parts because of the Kerr bound, they just give you an O1 factor. So these are the modulations that you have onto your, onto your um, you add onto your four dimensional Schwarzschild. But from a point of view of uh, from what we'll be considering is the fact that these are just one numbers. They don't scale with n. They don't scale with m. They don't scale with j. They are just you know they're in between zero, one and two for uh, for the big ones and one and zero in the the lower case for the temperature. In high in five dimensions or higher, these the curve is generalized by uh, Myers Perry black holes. I will focus only on black holes with one uh, one plane of directions. So there are, if you in higher dimensions, you can in principle consider higher ones, and the solutions are known. But for our purpose, it, it will just be one. And these are just straightforward generalizations. They're not really straightforward, but in terms of how you describe them, basically onto the first line is essentially Kerr, apart from the fact that you have d minus five, and then you add uh, add you know uh, you add a sphere factor to it. All of these don't. Um, all of these are just details that are not that important. 
But the important part is that basically you can still calculate the horizon and you can find that the horizon size is determined by the above formula and you can calculate the entropy. And for example, you can see for four dimensions, the entropy stops so you can have extremal curve. In five or higher dimensions, this kind of the amount of entropy you can have in J or how much angular momentum you can have changes. So for high, five and higher dimensions, actually the, the stability bounds are somewhere in the middle. So you can have normal plump black holes, which are approximately spherical, but you can also have more over rotating black holes. So black holes, which, um, which are unstable and then just uh, break down. Essentially they're unstable, they, they fragment and so on and so forth. Especially in high, six and higher dimensions, you can have really arbitrary, um, arbitrarily large angular momentum. Um, and especially if you go for five and higher dimensions, you can also have black rings. Black rings basically take, uh, take the fact that your angular momentum, your centrifugal force can counteract your gravitational interaction. So basically in five and higher dimensions, this is where the gravitational interaction is equal or uh, falls off with equal, equal or lower power than your, gravi uh, your, uh, your angular, um, angular, you know, sorry. The gravitational interaction is weaker in a sense than um, angular momentum. So you can stabilize your gravitational attraction by angular momentum. And this gives you these you black strings. And we've actually considered two different cases. First of all, you have a neutral, neutral black ring, or you can add fundamental string along the, along the black ring. And you can have what we would call a dipole black ring because one part of the fundamental charge will cancel out the other because they go in different directions. So all in all, asymptotically, you won't see any of the dipole. Um, important for us, which, which object, objects are stable. Essentially, the upshot of this is that objects which are relatively round are stable. So the bound that you need to, uh, that it's going to be important for us is the bound that whenever J is approximately less than equal to the entropy, which is actually what happens for the curve bound as well, all of these objects are stable. And in fact, this is slightly related to the two different sizes that you can add to, you can associate typical length scales to your, uh, to your angular momentum and to your mass. So whenever your gravitational size, so the, uh, the, the size that, um, associated to mass is lower, is greater than the mass of your, the length scale, uh, um, the length scale of your angular momentum, then your black hole is stable. Another way of saying this perhaps is to say that whenever you have a black hole, where most of the entropy comes actually from the mass rather than from the way you, you distribute your angular momentum, then this, this kind of solutions are stable. So spheroidal objects, not spherical, spheroidal, uh, are stable and ultra spinning objects, which have J is greater than S are unstable and they can fragment. The only exception that we're going to consider are dipole black rings, which are stable. So they can survive longer. Okay, so now. A single microstate. Oh, yeah, so a single microstate would violate this bound. Uh, yeah, um, but I, I mean, this is, this is on the black hole side, right? So. Uh, Yes, so uh, this kind of the cur uh, what we're considering now is the stability and curve bounds for black holes, right? So in principle, this it's a, it's a good question of how, what an individual microstate would would go when it goes up, but I think here we're both basically considering ensembles of states, right? So you want to map map your black hole, which you in terms of your microscopic picture you would think of an ensemble of different microstates, and you want to match them to an ensemble of you know a hot soup of strings. If you match an individual microstate up. I don't know what you would get. I think, yeah, yeah, I think you wouldn't get a black hole, right? So for example, I think if you start with the Lunin Matur picture, right? Lunin Matur, which is extremal, has zero entropy. I think there you have, you can think of an individual microstate, but you can map it directly down to your string configuration. So then there, there is no need for horowitz Bochinsky, right? So you, because you, or then there's no need for correspondence because you can directly map which, you, which gravitational configuration maps the maps onto your free string picture. 10 minutes, right? Okay. So again, let us play the picture that we saw for the static case. Let's keep S fixed. Let's keep the entropy fixed and let's keep the angular momentum fixed and let's vary the string coupling. 
We will consider two different cases now, actually, because what, what will happen is you can follow strings as you increase the, uh, the, the string coupling, and you can follow black holes or different black objects as you decrease the coupling. It won't be as simple as for static black holes, so you might have some different things because of this relative, because of different instabilities or different radiation process that you consider in the board. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to identify which stringy objects get mapped to which black hole objects. And what we want to consider is something that was kind of like one thing that we have to think about is something that's kind of implicit in all of these configurations. I was talking about the fact that we're, we're making an adiabatic connection between your black hole size and your string size. But the fact is that black holes radiate, so they won't be, they won't be stable, right? So they, they have an implicit, um, implicit time scale, which is the Hawking evaporation. So this is sort of like a minimal time scale that we need to consider as we decrease the coupling. So we cannot go, you know, arbitrarily slowly from one black hole, from black hole and we decrease it and decreases because as the, as we still have strong coupling, the, the black hole will evaporate, Hawking evaporation. And similarly, the string, as you increase the string coupling will start to radiate, you know, loops of string. And so eventually you have to consider um, the cases where the Hawking evaporation is the lowest length scale at which objects have to be stable. So anything that is uh, anything that fragments or anything that's unstable faster, so anything that's classically unstable probably won't survive the ride as you start with a black hole and go down to fundamental strings. Um, so now let's start with four dimensions. So we said we're going to only consider black hole, uh, the curved black hole. So we only consider curved black hole at strong coupling. And on the rotating string side, we, we have string balls, which are slowly rotating black uh, strings. We have rods uh, and we have pancakes. But because of the curve bound, as I said before, the, um, the horizon size and the black hole and the entropy of the Bekenstein Hawking entropy get corrected only by order one factor, which this correspondent principle is not actually, doesn't know about these order one factors. So everything to leading order just works out as for the non-rotating case. And one can summarize this by the fact that plump black holes, so spheroidal black holes, are matched with slowly rotating black strings. So in principle for Kerr in four dimensions, and this will generalize to all higher dimensions as well, slowly rotating Kerr or slowly rotating Myers-Perry black holes should correspond to slowly rotating strings. Well, let me just, uh, yeah, oops. But what about highly rotating uh, cases? So what about stringy bars, uh, for example? Um, so these objects should not have a stable counterpart of string coupling. And the fact is that as you increase G, those, uh, uh, these objects will start to radiate. So for example, a rod will start to be like an antenna and will start to uh, radiate uh, um, angular momentum. They will lose angular momentum. So what will happen is on this diagram, uh, oops, no, I cannot do this. On this diagram, they will start to move in uh, towards uh, lowering the angular momentum. And actually what happens is an interesting feature that we found before, there was a, there was a paper which describes some, some sort of hybrid strings where you can have loops of string which kind of like get sucked by, by black holes. And then you, the angular momentum is basically carried by fundamental strings, loops of strings uh, going around black holes. And one of the things that this happens is that the central part, the black hole, will not have that much angular momentum. So its correspondence will go basically as an almost non-rotating black hole because all of the angular momentum is sort of carried out by rotating strings. Now, again, these rotating strings, as you increase coupling, will radiate. So this object will be probably highly unstable. But nonetheless, if you, um, if you follow the correspondence through, what you can happen is that black bars will probably go to some kind of this kind of non-stable hybrid form, which will then clearly radiate away and go into a black hole, a black hole with, a, with small uh, rotation. And if you have pancakes, pancakes will again go pr probably into some ellip um, elliptical, uh, elliptical thing, which will radiate away. Five minutes, right? <laughs> okay. The results from D equals form naturally extend to higher dimensions. So for, as I said, uh, Myers-Perry black holes, which, which rotates, um, uh, which are just slightly rotating, uh, will be related to slightly rotating black strings. But now we have some uh, new objects. And in fact, what we have is we have ultra-spinning Myers-Perry black holes. We have ring-like solutions. 
Everything that's, as I said, ultra spinning is not stable. So basically, as we turn down the coupling, these objects won't survive the entire ride. So they will fragment. And in fact, what they will form is they will form individual string balls. So basically, you can think of them like even a ring. The ring will form like several balls which rotate around each other. And then each individual part, again, will transition as an individual slightly, non uh, slightly lower rotating string, which, which is well defined. If you have, if you finely fine tune your problem, so if you have an elliptical thing, which is perhaps survives a little bit longer, what can happen is that the horizon, the, the curvature at your endpoints becomes much larger than at your poles. So then at this point, you can all already start the correspondence, but here you will still be in the black hole size. So you, again, you might think that something which is, you know, perhaps slightly longer lived might go into something which is, um, uh, which is a hybrid. And then as you decrease it even further, the central part, which is slightly rotating, will go into a black ball, which is now has this um, black bar structure. And you can think of this as basically a black bar where all of these non-trivial excitations are at the central point. Um, the only difference is the dipole rings, which are stable, uh, can transition into plasmids, which are just these loops of fundamental strings running around. And these are stable, and these can be mapped one to another. So the final diagram looks something like this. We can see that even in higher dimensions, the, the side which is below the stability bound is as normal, uh, spherical to spherical. If you have something which is slightly more elongated or something which is non-stable ring, this string will fragment and it will go into its own because each individual part will have a slightly smaller entropy. The correspondence for them will be higher up. So basically, they will transform slightly further and they will become a lump of you know, orbiting well, slightly rotating black strings. Um, on the other hand, if you finally tune your problem, you can have your, uh, your hybrid models, which become something like a hybrid bar, and the plasmids work as normal. Pl plasmids are the only, or dipole black rings are the only thing which is stable and survives the right. Cool. Two minutes. Summary. Okay. So, as I said, the black hole string correspondence is something which gives you uh, stringy insights to what your black hole degrees of freedom are. And what we've done is we characterized or we cataloged all of the, the correspondence between rotating black holes and rotating strings uh, for four dimensions or higher. But we've done it for asymptotically flat space. So a possible obvious um, um, generalization is to try to think of other asymptotic space times. Uh, but what we found for asymptotically flat space is if you have rotating black holes below the stability bound, so if you have low angular momentum, then things naturally extend from the static case. If you have higher angular momentum, there are several non-trivial transitions that you need to take into account because of possible instabilities of your black hole solutions. Um, and one of the things that I perhaps haven't emphasized in the previous diagram is that in some of the cases, whether you go up and down, the changes, right? So your fate of your string is not exactly the fate of your perhaps corresponding black object, um, which might be slightly surprising given the fact that we're talking about an... You want to say that uh, if, you, if you go in one yeah. direction, so it's not invertible. Yes, yes. And this, this is probably because of the fact that you have instabilities, right? So if you have like, if you have, obviously, if you have like, uh, uh, balls, and if you have your uh, your um, your um, um, dipole rings, that works completely as normal. But if you start with the with the string bar, it goes up. It becomes a, something like um, um, something like a hybrid string. If it goes down, it can possibly transition into something which is slightly different. It should have the same entropy, but but these kind of transitions are not particularly. Um, I don't think that there has been. Uh, uh, a very explicit calculation that has been done, it might be interesting to see. Because there is one physical thing that you can think of is you can start with, a, for example, a string configuration, like a string bar, and you let a diloton wave in that locally increases your, um, locally increases your coupling, you let everything collapse, and then you let it down again. So your diloton wave passes, you again become a stringy configurations. Perhaps, perhaps you might get something which is like a curve or something. Okay, so as I, as I was just talking about, uh, some of the details of transitions are not that known. Um, we believe that this is the complete picture that we have here, but some details might be, need to be worked out. And I think this is a, it's, it's still a, 
there is a wide things a wide range of things that can be done in in the future uh what i tactically avoided was talking about the extremality so what happens for example if you need extremal bound i said that you know even if you in four dimensions um black objects will have to eventually cross this the, the extremal bound so that's slightly subtle and perhaps has to do with something like a Kerr cft correspondence um as i mentioned before you can extend this to other space times and there has been a, a uh, other space times are adding Ramon Ramon charges that it's uh, uh, currently been thought about with other people and something which we actually started thinking about a while ago, but then we figure out that the configurations, the, the space of these rotating objects hasn't been really um, explored yet was uh, can you found bound states at non zero coupling so when you turn on interactions and you have angular momentum for which configurations do exist bound states so which configuration have sort of like a um, boson, boson string star configuration or horowitz Wachinski star configuration. And that's something that we're thinking on at the moment as well. Okay, thank you very much.